Well, welcome back to Open to Truth, a podcast all about exploring big ideas and discovering truth together. My name's Clint. Hey, I'm Tony. Welcome back. And hey, we're going to do another mailbag episode. I love these. We did one about three months ago. Mm -hmm. We've been getting some comments and questions and just wanted to kind of run through these. This is my favorite, actually. I love interacting with listeners. It's great. A couple bits, two pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Yeah. Uh, if you're new to the podcast and this project, uh, be sure to subscribe to the blog. You can do that at opentotruth.com slash subscribe. And to this channel, that'd, do, uh, that'd be a big help for getting in front of more eyeballs. Secondly, this is just kind of at the meta level of what Open to Truth is all about. Mm. So I would love to hear from you guys, the audience, what kind of content you really enjoy here. Because here... Am, I'm run, running up against deciding what to talk about because there's two core groups of people that enjoy what we're doing that I've heard from. Yeah. One is uh, the the Christian who grew up in a conservative household and is kind of wondering about how their faith works in the modern era up against certain challenges and criticisms. Okay. Then on the other hand, I have people that tell me like, I wish you would just not talk about all that theology Bible stuff and keep doing the philosophy current events like the Bitcoin episode. Uh -huh. And they're maybe agnostic or atheist and just really enjoy that. Yeah. So they're they're pretty distinct crowds. And my instinct is to say, uh, well, one, I don't see the option of like splitting off the project into two different streams. I don't have the time yeah. for it really. Yeah, yeah. But secondly... I like the idea of each crowd, if they watch the other episodes, um, to be stretched in that direction. Yeah. Like, hey, agnostics out there, it's still, I think you should think it's an open question whether or not God exists and theology and some of these questions and at least how that might relate to your worldview. And then also people really interested in the whole deconstruction journey or something. There are these other topics that make up a worldview that are important to try to get a grip on. So hopefully what we're doing here uh, not only speaks to each of those crowds, but challenges them in some way. Well, I think part of the challenge of that is just that philosophy is a, it's a tool that you can bring to bear on any discipline, like just about any issue, any question could benefit from some careful thinking through mm -hmm. and talking through. So there's a challenge of obviously there's some intersection for all these things. You, you find yourself interested in all of them. Um, and I think, I think that is philosophy. So yeah, I'd love to know, we would love to know from you what kind of content you find most valuable. Right. Cause we, we can't be all things to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but we'd like to make sure that we're, you know, right. helping I don't you think we're trying helpful. to do everything. Like we, we're no, not doing no. cooking or <laughs> we how haven't to do done cooking yet or blacksmithing right. tips. Sure. It's in the realm of ideas. Skiing. <clears throat> yeah. Well, in any case, I, I thought of that to open us up just because a lot of the questions that people write in or comment are on the theological side of the equation. Okay. And we're getting less comments about the worldview philosophy stuff. Yeah. Um, so for whatever reason, the vocal crowd is into this. So here we go. So that's what all these questions are? Yeah, today? for the most part. And how many do we, how many are we going to get through? There's four. We're going to get through four of them. Okay. Yep. So first is from Krista. Okay. She asks, will God have enough patience and grace for those individuals who've almost buried their mustard seed of faith under the mountainous weight of endless wrestling and grappling with hard questions? Or for those whose hearts are so broken by loss, they can't return to him. Will he have enough patience and grace for those who plant themselves honestly and earnestly in the camp of I just don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sending that in. Yeah. And that's a pretty heartfelt question. To be sure, there are, <laughs> if not Krista, I don't know if you're in this one of those camps, probably, given that you wrote it. Um, but I'm sure you're not alone in that. There are, are a lot of people, I think, that have either abandoned faith or uh, never got into it in the first place, given how much loss and hurt they've experienced. Um, we're just feeling like you can't know or don't know yeah, and don't feel 
like you'd, it would be responsible to make a proclamation of faith or something. Um, I don't know. Did you have an initial? Well, I mean, I just, I, th- my head went immediately to how Jesus responded to someone like Thomas, who's we all know as the doubter, poor mm-hmm. bloke, had had a moment of questioning everything and forever been branded the doubter. Right. <laughs> but Jeez. what at least what I see in Jesus there is a moving towards the one who is doubting, not a sending away, not mm. a not a rejection of or a rebuke of, but a a moving towards and a trying to convince as well, like a willingness to convince. Hmm. But, you know, see the wounds, touch the wounds, whatever it takes to show you that I'm the real deal, you know. Yeah. So at least if that reveals anything about God's how God feels about folks who are doubting or wrestling with their faith, it seems like it's, at least in Jesus, I see patience for that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, just like what the the meat of the question, will God have enough patience and grace for X? I mean, fill in the blank. Yeah. I'd like to say yes for whatever. anything. <laughs> Where, whenever X, right. you know, whatever X is, yeah. yes, he will have enough for it. Uh, is the I, alternative there like some kind of a hell or something? I or would like, think so. I that? think it ultimately comes down to that, right? Yeah. Where what would it look like for him to not have enough patience? Right. He's he says, "I'm done with." There's you. a location you need to go to where you're not experiencing that patience or grace. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Um. So I don't know if I want to dive in all the way into the hell sure. conversation, but um. Well, the, uh, another thing that might be helpful. I don't know, Krista, if you've read. The Sin of Certainty by Pete Enns. That's like, I've probably talked about this book on the podcast a bunch, but I found that to be a really helpful read during some deconstruction type stuff where you find yourself sort of adrift in an open sea of ideas and and feeling pretty ankyless at times. Um, that book is a good, the, the Sin of Certainty by Pete Enns. Good. It gives you permission to be a little more okay with gray and not black and white and, and not being so certain about things. And that, that that actually might be what God prefers is somebody who doesn't need to have all the answers and doesn't need to have it all figured out, but instead trusts. I think the subtext of the of the subtitle is God, why God desires our trust instead of our correct beliefs or something like hmm. that. So yeah, Sin of Certainty by Pete Enns. Check that out. That's a helpful yeah. book. Well, and too, like... Um Maybe if, like we, we could flip the question back on not just Krista, but anyone thinking through this. Um, what what do you plan to do in the meantime? So let's say you do have the stance of, I just don't know anymore. Yep. Um, w- what kind of behavior, I guess, are you asking for God to have patience and grace on you for? Oh, good. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, like for someone to be gracious toward you, it'd be like... the the context of it is maybe you are doing something that's not ideal or yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know what that would be. Um, maybe someone asking this is like, maybe not, I don't know. Maybe they grew up being told you need to read the Bible this amount or pray this amount (laughs) go to church this amount. And they're feeling like they don't want to do, they're just finding themselves a lack of desire to do those things yeah. stemming from the not knowing. I just, I don't know if any of this is true. Yeah. So I'm less inclined to sacrifice my time to pursue these religious goals um, or spiritual goals when I'm not sure that any of it's real or true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so maybe that's the behavior they're asking for patience or grace through. And yeah. to that, I would still say, yes, God does, have the patience and grace to and uh, to walk with you through that. I would just encourage someone going through this to um, just remain open as much as you can. Intellectual virtue of openness. Be open to experiencing new things. Uh, even in the midst of uncertainty, which I don't, is not a bad thing necessarily, yeah. but <clears throat> to still go out of your way at times, make that sacrifice to put yourself into situations where maybe you do have an encounter with the divine and Mm -hmm. i don't know if that is a a local expression of corporate worship or even just intentionally going out with some solitude and silence to Mm -hmm. to be with god if god's there Um, yeah yeah that's good man that's good that's my answer hope that's helpful yeah krista good question 
uh, from Brent. This is from YouTube. Brent asks this. If your personal conviction is evidence for Yahweh's existence, is a Muslim's personal convic- conviction evidence for Allah? Allah? Allah's existence. Allah, I think. Allah? Okay. Yeah. Forgive me. Good. <laughs> Were you asking Allah? Everyone. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> asking Allah to forgive you. <laughs> I haven't done that before. So, yeah, how's that strike This is you? going back to which episode were you talking about this? <clears throat> uh, this was way back. Um, this was a while ago, right? Yeah, back in 2020, November-ish. We were, uh, did a whole episode on natural theology. Yep, does natural theology work? And I was saying maybe not and offered this other avenue. Uh, I guess I was hanging my hat on religious experience as a more foundational, evidential ground for theistic belief. Yes. Okay. And his question is, if you justify your belief in God on the basis of your religious experience, mm-hmm. is, well, I, I guess we can tease it out a few different ways. Yep. Is a, a Muslim just as justified in his belief in Allah? If he's had a religious experience, should you be convinced by his religious experience? I don't think that's the case. That the was, second part? That was never part of your claim in the natural theology discussion right is that right. your personal experience <clears throat> shouldn't compel anybody else to believe so a couple of quick distinctions some tools to use for this response uh to brent's question i think we have to keep in mind the difference between privately available evidence and publicly available evidence so publicly available evidence is evidence that anyone who's observing it could get a handle on latch on to and incorporate into their own evidential structure, just like you or I would. Yeah. Uh, so imagine a, a, a spectator sport where LeBron James has dunked the ball and I'm seeing the ball go through the hoop. That's like public evidence of the Lakers should get two points. Yep. Right? I saw the ball go through the hoop and everyone else did. And there's nothing in principle stopping anyone in that room as long as they have the correct functioning machinery to witness that yep yep it it performs the same role in your belief structure as I, it would for me mm-hmm. now privately available evidence is different so right now i have a little tickle in my throat me too a man. little bit of a pain yeah. yeah me too. and you don't have the evidence for that like i do no now i reported it i have testimony you have testimonial evidence i've testified to this pain but the felt acquaintance with this pain, that one, the yeah. one that's happening here, you don't have. No. Now you can conjure, and may, and you even just said like I do too. Wow, what, what what's going on there? You are <coughs> inferring that Sorry. the feeling that you have is similar to my feeling, but it's not the same. It's not no. It's, it's not the same. They're numerically distinct, yeah. if anything. So they're privately available experiences. My private experience cannot. I don't, or at least should not play a very important evidential role for you at all. Right. On, the only way it would is that it undergirds the testimonial evidence that I'm giving to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So one way of answering Brent's question then is to say, look, if someone, let's say Iran, I guess, yeah. that, or and, I mean, I guess they populate the globe, but yeah, Muslims. Yeah. Yes, they do. So... Medina. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. guess a fair few. There's a few. There are a few. There's a few. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so their experiential evidence of Allah, and that I'm already having trouble with that s- sentence, but okay. just bear, if you can accept that for a moment, uh, is not, uh, that doesn't count as evidence for me that Allah exists. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that? Wild no. to say? Okay. No. Now, another way of picking on this is what I had a problem with even uttering personal experience that supports the claim that Allah exists is it just, I'm worried that it's just confusing what's exactly going on here and how yeah. these words have come to the fore. So I just want to make room for this possibility that there is one God ultimate reality, creator of everything, sustainer, rescuer, let's say. Mm -hmm. And 
human being, if, if God so chooses to self-disclose and self-reveal in some way, that all sorts of human beings could be having experiences <clears throat> of the one yeah. God that exists. Yes. So I am not trying to say that Muslims do not have genuine religious experiences. That's bonkers, dude. Right, right. Your view has to leave open the notion that people that think differently from you and have different cultural backgrounds have genuine religious experiences. Yeah. Now, again, if you're an agnostic or atheist, you might interpret them differently as just firings in the brain like yeah. anything else. Uh, merely so, right? Yep. And no, nothing supernatural is going on, going on there. But let's say that it is. That um, it's then another claim to say like, oh, I've experienced Allah, or I've experienced Yahweh. Yes, it is. Now, now I've made an, an inference. I have had this not what this maybe this is too heavy sledding, but non-propositional. Okay. So a proposition or a statement, there's, it doesn't have content to it. I just had a raw, if you can imagine, just the f- phenomenology of it. There's a phenomenon that I'm acquainted with. Yeah. The painfulness of pain. Yeah. It doesn't have a linguistic texture to it. You know, it's just a felt feeling. We can try to describe it with language, but the feeling itself was non-propositional. Okay? Yes. But all of a sudden, when I do try to bring language to the table to describe it or to tell someone about it. Uh, that's also the place where inferences are then being made. Um, so we can wonder all day about whether your personal experience and how you've chosen to linguistically represent it uh, is can be used to infer any particular theological claim. <laughs> That makes sense. Um, yeah, I think it could be. So let's say, let's give an example. Okay. Uh, let's say the Christian and the Muslim both have a experience of conviction in one's conscience, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe a, a leading or a guiding. Go talk to that lady at the Speedway gas station. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm I'm having that <coughs> thought in my conscience that this is something I ought to do. Again, could just be on the th- stream of consciousness. This little thought bubble has arisen and there's nothing why I talk about God with it at all, but table that for a moment. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. The Muslim who's grown up in a Muslim community and had all of these beliefs instilled from a young age or even an adult convert yep. will likely interpret that experience as, Oh, Allah is yeah. communicating with me. Right. Right. And I don't have that thought. I've never thought that in my life. Yeah. I've brought to the table uh, the Jesus figure, uh, maybe Yahweh. I don't often think about Yahweh, but I typically just think of the word God. Yep. But sure, okay. And I typically attribute those experiences to that. I'm using that label, Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, to pick out that entity that's doing that for me. Yeah. I think what you're getting at is just like, what does it mean what does it mean to be referring to the same object with different language or different words? Like if there is some transcendental yeah. divine being, it could be the case that both the Muslim and the Christian have some experiences which they can accurately attribute to being that divine being, and they'll use certain words to do that. Others that maybe they shouldn't attribute but do, that happens as well, like mistakes, false negatives or false positives on both sides as well. So... You said just way simpler. Is that okay? Yeah, way more simply what I was okay. yeah, that's, laying the groundwork for. That's why I'm here, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> now, this isn't to say either that the theology that has been built around the term Yahweh and the term Allah are the same or equivalent. No, not and they're at all. The same. No. no. The, um, the character, I know that's probably annoying, the character Yahweh and the character Allah have distinct traits. Yes. You know? Yeah, which is, just goes back to, and not to spend too long here, but you, one of the points you make in the natural theology argument is if we're going to search for some sort of existential rescuer or a divine being, let's start with the minimum thing that we're looking for. Let's not get super specific with this being has a name, its name is Allah, or mm-hmm. its name is Yahweh, it has this particular relationship with 
the Jewish people, whatever, you know, little particulars you want to make about the God. Start with the most general God term you can, anything that would fit that description that would solve your existential need, whether mm-hmm. that's rescue from moral failing, rescue from suffering, rescue from death. Let's start there and see if we can find evidence. Once you start to, like this guy is saying, say that the Muslim had evidence for Allah, it's like, well, what what separated that to make that Allah specific that wouldn't apply to mm-hmm. this general God figure? Anyway. I don't know so uh, th- Brent went on to claim that personal conviction then is an unreliable path to truth. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, he was, says unreliable because... Look, both parties had um, religious experiences, like the same method, led to different belief outcomes. Yeah. Um, But that to me, uh, I don't know if that makes it unreliable. I I just don't know if that follows, but... You're saying, or he's saying... That because yeah. both right. both the Christian and the Muslim in this case follow their personal experiences and personal conviction and arrive at, you know, conclusions that conflict with one another. Mm-hmm. That personal conviction is not a trustworthy epistemic to me, yeah, tool. That's right. right. And to me, that entirely depends on uh, what truth claim is being made once you've inferred upon that experience. So right. I might I might even suggest that it is maybe not correct to make such grand inferences on the basis of your personal experience. Yes. So that's I, kind the, of what I was trying the to the mistake say. came in the inference, not the experience. Yep. Yes. Don't yeah. infer more than you should yeah. from your religious experience. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. That's good. Uh Joe Joe asked, nope, he commented. I pulled this out. He made more of a comment. No question. He asserted something. We don't have to imagine what God is like. The only true God is revealed in Jesus Christ. Amen. (laughs) Okay. I don't know if that was a prayer, but. (laughs) Thank you, Joe. (laughs) Thank you, Joe. Uh, So this was on the heels of one of our past episodes with Paul Young. Yeah. And Brad Jerzak. They were describing uh, this imaginative prayer exercise that they led this woman through and she had this profound yeah. experience of God. Uh, and he said, well, we don't have to imagine what God's like. He, he was right over there. Jesus, yeah. why, why are we using imagination? I don't have to dream anything up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that exercise was, that was challenging for me to hear. And like, it's it's, I get what they're saying. And I see even overlap there between like active imagination as a therapy tool and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen that that there's something going on there. There's something very interesting about it. I hesitate to place much confidence in my distinguishing between my very strange at times imagination and the voice of God. So I would want to know more about what Brad and Paul were saying, Mm -hmm. but I do, for better or worse, think there's some value in looking at the Jesus that... What's this guy's name? Who? Joe. Joe? Yeah. The questioner? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Joe says, the Jesus revealed in scripture. And then from there, building a model of what is this Jesus personality like and extrapolating. Well, like that's what the question, what would Jesus do, is attempting to have you do. Imagine how Jesus would handle this situation. Mm -hmm. Extrapolate from what you know about Jesus, from what you know about God as revealed in Jesus through scripture. Extrapolate and figure out then how he would live your life in your shoes right now. That's what that question is for. So, and I Mm -hmm. think there's some value in that approach, right? Yeah. Imagining what Jesus would say or do. Well, I almost want to, um, I almost want to just give a direct negation to Joe's claim. Just a no, just I, a flat no from Clint. I think, <laughs> I think we have to imagine what God is like. Yeah. Depending on what you mean by imagine, but he, he, here I am. I'm just, I'm a guy. All these other people were just guys that wrote scripture. Yeah. That were walking around with Jesus, and I get that they were getting something pretty firsthand in a way that I am not. So they're not really imagining but it's at least uh there's something 
there's again it's like it's that epistemic gap yeah. between god and myself and one way i might try to get there is my imagination and seeing if god speaks to me in that space right or like when the biblical authors were authors were writing about god um the i mean i guess it does matter what you think of how scripture was inspired yeah um but but at the very least like we said in the past few episodes it's a a history of a community of faith trying their best to understand what god is like yeah and so does the imagination come into that sometimes sure yes you know i think so yeah what would it look like using that maybe i'm mixing words with what it means to imagine but yeah, I don't know what it would look like to not imagine what God is like, right? <laughs> or at least what Jesus is like. Imagine, you know, to uh, <laughs> yeah, to create in one's mind an image. Yeah, uh, yeah I yeah. feel like I have to. Yeah, so, so I think I think there's some imagination involved, but I guess I would share Joe's has some of Joe's hesitations with mm-hmm. the strategy brought Brad and Paul later. Like maybe it shouldn't be totally theology guiding. Yeah, or it should be done like in community or something. Bounce ideas off people. I just know. Yeah, good point, man. There's possibility for really crazy. Like, I met Jesus in my heart, and he yeah. said, "He told me I'm the Archangel Michael." Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. There's some people who are. Way I've always off, existed. Way off the deep end. <laughs> yeah. uh, that have ideas about what God's saying to them. So I, I think, I don't claim to know what the appropriate boundaries or guidelines around that are. I think there's something really interesting happening there. But mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's a little, I say, a red flag, ca- pink flag for me as well. Oh, okay. It's a little bit <laughs> a caution, pink flag. caution flag. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. All right. On to a final question from Bill. Bill, Bill asked, are demons real? Nice one, Bill. Now, you are not a horror movie fan. And it's, it's particularly oh. the demon ones that get you. I can watch home invasion ones all day. Not a problem. That's not the case for me. Because I, I can. Home invasion. Because and this maybe maybe this just is crazy, but you think you can fight off a physical? No, attack. I just it's so unlikely to actually happen that I can write it off. Like it's just I'm not going to be home invaded. Okay, more likely to be demon harassed. I, my faith community growing up would have said yes. <laughs> yeah, and that still lingers in you because those movies. He's at work. They ignite something. Prowling He's around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. Yeah, and I might be next. He's on the prowl yeah. always. Okay, well, let's kind of go through this then. How would you systematically talk about this? Uh, why think? Why even use the word demon? Mm-hmm. Like, why even think about it at all? Why did you ask this? Great place well, to start. Well, because it's, some people have talked about it. <laughs> before, before you and I existed, other people were wondering about yeah. it. So let's follow their lead. What were they thinking? Yeah. Well, you see it a lot in the New Testament. I can't say off the top of my head how many times it's in the Old Testament. But I think it's really, really rare. Yeah. Maybe not at all. I th- Demon. I can think of a like a lying spirit. Oh. Uh, there was a lying spirit okay. at one point. The uh, witch of Endor. Yeah. A little bit. She of, was conjuring. She was in touch with some Samuel, the ghost. Nefarious or, yeah, spirits. Okay. I don't know if there's possession, like uh throwing foaming at the mouth, throwing in the fire, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Correct us if we're wrong. If yeah. I'm missing one. Get to the New Testament though, and you'll find it peppered throughout yeah. reference to demon possession. Uh, Jesus in particular is casting out demons. Uh, apparently they can be inside you or possess you in you some way. You could be a and, demoniac. Yeah. you got a t- heaps of them. <laughs> heaps of them. Yeah. So there, uh, yeah, there's r- an initial reason to think that they are real spirits, personalities mm-hmm. that are out there in the world. I mean, <laughs> At one level, it could be as easy as like way to answer this as, look, if you're willing to make space in your ontology, things that exist, for an incorporeal spirit God, yeah. that is all good. I mean, I, I guess there could be uh, some personalities that are uh, somewhat bad, if not all-consuming uh-huh. bad. In, that's not in principle off the table once you've already made no. the commitment to theism. No. Correct? Right. Okay. That's different. I used to pick see, I used to picture though them as being not just in incorporeal, 
but I can picture them. So they must have a body or some kind of an mm, outline. They manifest. They were they were muscular, uh, your classic demon guy. Red skinned. Re- yeah, red. Well, yeah, something sh- shadowy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and they would be places. They like physically located, whether mm-hmm. in your bedroom or under your bed or you know, on in your car. Some of them like to hang out in different locations, like right. that's their main place. Mm-hmm. So that, but that is different from just an an unembodied mind or a, uh, a an agent, a a, a will, mm-hmm. which I think is what you're. That's maybe a little more of a mature way to think about it, right? If you were going to postulate, oh, I don't know these unembodied personalities. I'm just. It's more mature to think of a, <laughs> as a disembodied spirit than the oh, lo- I, localized i just don't know how much i don't know really what it whether it makes sense to say that it's a spirit but then also say it takes form and it mm-hmm. but i guess yeah who knows i don't know it's less it's not um i don't think it's contradictory right it's just mysterious <laughs> i see i see Very, those are different like they would ha- i remember reading a book one time that explained demonology and <laughs> I mean, I don't think it claimed to be the final okay. yeah. textbook on it. It was explaining like how they levitate objects by like holding them up, but you can't see the demon. And there's like diagrams and everything. So the object oh, is floating, man, dude. The, wow, wow, you wow. don't see the demon. So they're, they're tricksters. They Interdimensional. Make, they make it look like they're levitating things, but they're not really. He's just holding it. Weird, man. Yeah. So sorry to take us. No, you're, no it's that, on track. That is, I think, how a lot of people conceive of them as, you know, invisible dudes. Who are trying to get you, mm-hmm. torment you. Now, here's another just uh, <clears throat> filament of this that maybe a more liberal or progressive uh, biblical interpreter would, would do with this. So yeah. they would see talk of demons in the scriptures and church fathers and what have you and say like, oh, well, of course, yeah, ancient people thought that those were real sorts of things. You have myths and different legends up until then talking all about like even from greek mythology of hades and in the story of odysseus's return home from the trojan war he encounters the ghosts of agamemnon and achilles down in hades okay so there's like there's a and those aren't those are dead humans in spirit form Mm -hmm. so not necessarily a demon but just the idea of a ghost or something or a spirit that's not god that would have a localized place um there's precedent for this starting to come into a more central theological place um yeah and you have some other biblical stories such as like the story of job and the satan the accuser uh is testing god and um, there's this whole passage in ezekiel about the king of tyre or tyrion or something (laughs) tyre a tire Tyrion's from <laughs> wow <laughs> and uh, there's a few paragraphs about like an angel falling from heaven and, yeah uh, so there's this whole story told about lucifer was this angel second in command to god or something and yeah was the worship leader or choir yeah. director or something and uh desired power over god so rebelled and took a host of angels with him it's a fallen angel pride first uh, sin and these are the demons that exist now they don't really die I guess angels are immortal and so they are as well, even though they've chosen to rebel against God. Was it he, he took two thirds or he took a third of the angels? I'm not sure. How's that? I think a third. Yeah. I think a third of the angels went with him in this. So there's twice two angels for every demon, Mm -hmm. but there's there's the same type of thing. Yeah. 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 Which is interesting. That's not always made super clear in art. They're like factions. Yeah. 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 It's just, yeah. One's not right. a totally uh, different creature with a tail and horns and stuff, right. and the angel's a, a humanoid thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's all the story surrounding it, and so a I think a liberal modern interpreter would say, of course they thought that they wrote about that Jesus spoke in that language, but really now we know that, or it's it's just far more likely that these were just extreme mental illnesses manifesting in people. Mm. So when someone's writhing around, frothing at the mouth, it's much more likely they have some kind of 
epilepsy or something yeah man yeah. seizure epileptic epileptic attack yeah uh and it's not a spiritual being inhabiting that body yeah now that being said so i'm willing to entertain that like i'm i've made space in my hermeneutics that that could be the answer to this question and i don't think it detracts from what jesus is trying to do it's just yeah you know, all truth is god's truth Different so if that's the true then thing. i want to take it on you know yeah but on the other hand and i haven't had firsthand experience of the sorts that some of these guys talk about but boy i mean we've i think we've brought up on another podcast before but uh old mate that traveled the world and ran, yeah yeah can yeah. you tell us about papa sure <laughs> yeah back in um back in australia this must have been early 2000s there's this guy john safran who did this tv show called john safran versus god and he was a skeptic like an atheist guy who wanted to go out and sort of sample the dif- the different experiences that the various religions of the world had to offer to try to find out which ones are true, which ones actually have something going, whatever. So he, you know, he went to the, he got a fatwa put on him. Uh, and then he got, he went to where he went and did peyote in the desert and wow. then he went and drank blood in a voodoo ritual. And anyway, one of the things he did was <clears throat> in Africa, some voodoo tribe that, they have, I don't know if there was this hat that they would wear or something, but they would call on the spirit of Papagete. I don't know who Papagete is, but oh, that is this demon to like possess one of them. And they would like, you know, dance around the town and mm-hmm. be all lanky and strange. And and he of, would speak through that person, whoever was wearing yeah, the, he would, the hat. He would speak through, Pap- yeah, Papagete with the spirit would speak through the person. Mm-hmm. And their voice would change and all sorts of things. Anyway. So John Safran went there and did this. And at the end of his little tour, the end of the series, he's wrapping up with, I think, a Catholic priest or a Christian, maybe it's an evangelical church, that performs some kind of an exorcism with him. And they go through a list of like, have you ever done drugs? Have you ever mm-hmm. participated in voodoo? He's like, yeah, check it all, man. I've done all of it. <laughs> you know? uh, they're like, man, you are loaded with demons. we got to pray these out. No, so kidding. they lay hands, start praying on him. And um, Papa Gede starts to manifest, which is what's so strange is that like John Safran has a lisp. It's kind of part of his thing is he's got a lisp. That's it's recognizable. And when Papa Gede speaks through him, he has no lisp. And he was. This is l- recorded. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the show. Oh, no kidding. It's at least it rattled him enough that I think he then became he became Catholic after the whole experiment was all said and done. Wow. So something in Catholicism mm-hmm. gripped him. That's um, super interesting. So that's Papa Gede. One And another thinker that I really respect, Greg Boyd. Sure. Um, I read a lot of his stuff. But for him, like, demons and the... Uh, yeah, yeah, demons. Play a very large role in his theology. Yeah, they're like they, that's huge how, explanatory force. For the problem of evil. Um, it's the main reason why there's, like, illness and sickness and strife in the world. It's, it's all demons. Uh, and he is convinced of that because of certain, exp- he feels like he's seen it manifest right in front of him. Like, um, you would lose your mind, man. Of me. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining if something demonic manifested in front of you. Right. Like really how upsetting that would be. For it, you. It'd have to be pretty stark. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's been, I've been in, I mean, I grew up in a charismatic kind of Pentecostal ish yeah. sort of vibe and there were things that happened all the time that you're like, is that demon <laughs> possession? And yeah, yeah, people being a little bit crazy. Yeah. So man, I, I don't feel like I know for sure Yeah. that there are, and I don't know how many I have a lot of here. Okay. So we've given some reasons why here are some reasons that give me doubt yeah. that I haven't really heard good answers for that. And why I remain a little bit agnostic. Um, I don't have a great sense of why I'm not oppressed more by demons. Yeah, yeah. Now, I get it. They C- want you to think they don't exist. C.S. Lewis. They operate in secret. Wrote the screw tape letters. He's writing like the characters in the, in the book are demons. It's an older one advising a younger demon. Great I, book. I don't know how that works, but Read that. there's, there's different ranks. ages. Yeah, but I yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> thought they were all maybe created at the same time. But he's like, oh, don't let... Don't, don't just let anyone know that you exist. Like it can be, uh, it can derail someone away from the path of God to not know you exist and be caught up in the lusts of the world. Yeah, let's pull say. the strings with subtlety. Yeah. 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 So maybe I'm, that could be the case, but for some reason, like even just how you started off with this question of like, 
kind of laughing about how I'm in particularly afraid of. So I already think they're real. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like in, in I'm afraid of them in that sense. So I'm I'm a little bit worried about being uh, oppressed. Yeah. And so why not? Just prime pickings, boys. Take me out of the game. Yeah. Just uh, take you, out Clint. You can he's take doing him too, out. So he's doing too much for the kingdom. One evening. Yeah. You could take him. Out. I mean, honestly, that. <laughs> They could do a lot of psychological damage. If it's anything like the horror films. Right. Yeah, yeah. Or even... A, if there's hags appearing in your bedroom and like, yeah. Well, just... And it doesn't even have to be... I'm saying that's frightening, of course. I'm saying they could just turn up the dial a little bit. Just different weird little stuff out the day. Just move yeah. stuff? Yep. Or um, <laughs> like have the sound of an acorn hitting my car while I'm driving, like periodically. Well, so just slight annoyances? Yeah, Sli- just like... Slightly annoying. Really get me, you know? No, that's interesting. Yeah. I- I, it just seems like there's so much more they could be doing to prowl and seek and destroy. There's not enough of them. I could... I mean, so at this point, I just don't know. Like, how many are there? And Yeah. I, like, if scripture is supposed to be a clue about that, I don't think it tells you at all how many. Yeah. There's a host. There's a heavenly host. Now, do you think that you have... This is one of the main things demons were doing, I think, is submitting thoughts to you that aren't your own. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He whispers lies to you, the enemy. That's what the enemy does. So do you think that's the case? Do you think... Like, I think there's something interesting there, or there's an interesting phenomenon that's being described there. The case of having a dark, intrusive thought or the kind of thought that you know is not what's best for you if you were to follow that. Now, the Mm -hmm. origin of those thoughts, that's up for grabs. I think the origin of just about any thought is up for grabs. Who knows where any of them come from? But I think -hmm. think there is something interesting that's happening there that's trying to be described and maybe the language of demon is the best way to do it. I heard something that Hmm. made, like a thought occurred to me that frightened me. And so I'm attributing that to a demon or a thought occurred to me that I was ugly or would not look good on me. I don't want to identify with it. That wasn't me. A demon told me to do that and I'm not going to something like that. Um, But just increasingly for me, man, the realms of the spiritual and the psychological are are continuing to merge closer and closer together. Um, So I hesitate to draw hard and fast boundaries here Mm -hmm. as far as metaphysics. And yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful. I'm not saying, Yes or no, I guess, ultimately, to that question. Yeah. Um, to, uh, but I like how you ended that with, I think that's an, at least a nice place to temporarily hang your hat and that, like, yeah, there's these real phenomena. I am going through dark things yeah. sometimes. Um, and scripture, let's say, talks about this as demons. Yeah. And just how do we think of that word? Are, is it a a real spirit thing with its own goals and and mission that's right. trying to do it or or what but right and it could be the case that it's really help like it's really helpful to think about like do not give the enemy a foothold and maybe it is helpful to conceptualize it as sort of a battle to stay virtuous and mm-hmm. not allowing the enemy to get ground or whatever yeah yeah and i'd be interested to wonder uh doesn't make a difference what you think about it that's good like yeah. uh would i be ill-equipped to fight off the enemy if i did not think he Believe was a, a genuine uh, person yeah i don't know yeah but all right well that's uh the four questions for this court. i love the mailbag episodes <laughs> yeah. i love these yeah please send in questions we'd love to do more of this absolutely kind of thing. so yeah. i guess we'll do it like i don't know once a quarter just yeah, yeah. let some questions trickle in and that sounds right yeah well, thanks for watching. Uh, you can, again, comment on this video. That helps us a bunch. We will, I will interact with you. That's a promise. You Not every YouTube creator does It's not that. an assistant. Yeah. It's not an employee of Open to Truth. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Clint. Yeah. It's the real deal. Uh, or you can write in. Uh, if you don't want it to be public, you can write in to mailbag at opentotruth.com. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So Sounds thanks good. for watching. We'll see you. We'll see you. Stay curious. <laughs> <laughs>